Okay, it's, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Duong Fang from Columbia, who's gonna talk about L infinity estimates for the Majin pair and other fully nonlinear equations in complex geometry. Thank you very much. Great honor to speak at this conference in memory of Professor Duang So it's a great honor for me to speak at this conference in honor of, in memory of Professor Duang it's also very sad as he was my uh, mentor and colleague for more than 30 years. And I'm a little bit embarrassed that the talk is not directly related to the uh, main theme of the conference, but uh, he was a very kind and encouraging person. And uh, he, he, I hope he wouldn't mind. So as the title says here, uh, I would like to speak about L infinity estimates for Mojan pair and fully nonlinear equations in complex geometry. This is a very uh, classic topic right, in complex geometry, but last year there was a lot of progress and I think there is a high possibility for a lot more. So I would like to discuss uh, some of these developments. So, so let me begin by, uh, by introducing the complex Mojan pair equation. It's probably not needed to this audience, but uh, let, let me just do it anyway, if only to set up the notation. So let's consider for the, uh, the, the problem of assigning a volume form. So if you have, uh, if you have a, a smooth manifold, what happened here? I cannot show, oh, here it is. So you see this little dot? <laughs> Anyway, so if you ever have a smooth orientable manifold, then given a positive form, I can consider the problem of finding a metric with that as volume form. And this is very simple. It simply means that we look for a, a, a metric Gij satisfying this algebraic equation, which can be solved point by point and has infinitely many solutions. But the situation changes drastically. If now we have a, a compact Keller manifold, and we have, we consider the same problem, but with a cohomological constraint, right? So more precisely, let's take uh, omega and NN form. And, so, and let's fix a, a Keller class omega zero, which is the positive Durham cohomology class and, and we require that it satisfies this compatibility condition that uh, this, uh, the, the class to the end is the same as the class of omega. And our problem now is again to find a metric right, satisfying this uh, volume condition, but this time with the requirement that omega is in the class omega zero. Now, by the DD bar lemma, this constraint here is easily made explicit. Right? The DD bar lemma says that we have omega belongs to this class if and only if omega differs by omega zero by I DD bar T where phi is, is a function which is unique up to an additive constant. So if we just take omega to be this, our candidate, then this equation here just becomes this one, right? Omega to the n is now omega zero plus i d d bar phi to the n. The right-hand side is omega. And so this is now a second order PDE, right? Because the unknown now is phi and we have here a second order. So in, in coordinates, we can of course write this as simply a determinant right, of uh, omega zero shifted by the Hessian of phi. So, so this, the, the problem, this simple problem of uh, assigning volume form is, uh, becomes complicated in Keller geometry, but, uh, but there is a payoff. Right? And, and that's what I would like to mention uh, immediately. Uh, let's see, let's see this thing. Uh, do you see it somewhere? <laughs> ah, here it is. So uh, the, the, there's a bigger, much bigger payoff because in, in Keller geometry, the volume is much more directly related to the Ricci curvature. In fact, uh, we have a very simple formula that the Ricci curvature of a metric is simply minus I dd bar the log of its volume form. Right? So explicitly that's given by, by this equation. And now this also tells us uh, a few very uh, useful things that if you look at the Durham class of this, which is obviously a closed form, then it's actually independent of omega because if you change it to another omega, you are simply changing the volume form. 
and the ratio is a scalar. So therefore, the, the, the two forms are equivalent. So, so this is, of course, known as the first churn class of, of X, and it's represented by the, by the Ricci form of any Keller metric. Now, so you see that from here, if we want to, from this point, if we want to ask questions about the Ricci curvature, we can reduce it to questions about the Mohs Ampere equation. So here's the most uh, famous uh, example, which started the, the theory in a sense, which, uh, which is the Calabi conjecture. So the Calabi conjecture says the following, that if you have a compact Keller manifold with let's say zero first term class, then in any Keller class, omega zero, there exists a unique Keller metric with uh, zero Ricci curvature. So and now given the previous uh, uh, comments, it's rather easy to see that this can be reduced to more jump air equation. Because right, since we are looking for metric in this Keller class, once again, we set omega is equal to omega zero plus I D D bar P. And the equation to be solved is Ricci omega is equal to zero. But then Ricci of omega by this formula is given by minus I D D bar log of the volume. And now we want to introduce the volume, uh, the volume of, the, of the reference metric omega zero. So let's rewrite this under this form with the advantage that this is now a scalar. But now, Ricci, uh, the first chain class is zero, right? The first chain class is represented by Ricci of any form. So let's, let's take it the form uh, Ricci of omega zero. So this is zero means that Ricci of omega zero is equal to minus I dd bar f. And if we substitute in here, we see dd bar appear everywhere. So we can remove that up to a constant and we find the equation of that this, the log of this ratio is equal to f, which can be rewritten like this. So this is then the, the, the Mohs Ampere equation, right? It's a second order nonlinear uh, equation in phi. The right hand side is EF omega zero to the N. We require that this, uh, this form be strictly positive so that it be a metric, right? And from the PD point of view, this is very important because it makes, it makes the equation elliptic. And now notice also that the function F is only determined up to a constant. So we can always choose it so that it satisfies this normalization condition, which is necessary because if you integrate both sides, then the volume of this is the same as the volume of omega zero, and, and it should, uh, then you should get this, uh, this uh, identity. So this is the complex motion Ampere equation, and it was solved by Yao in, his, in 1976 in his famous solution of the Calabi conjecture. Now, let me say a few things about his solution and especially the reduction to C0 estimate, just to illustrate how important C0 estimates are. So, so here are the uh, estimates for Mohs Ampere. Right? So in the method of continuity to solve the equation, right, you, uh, you, you deform it, right? And, and here's a deformation, right? So it's a very similar to the original equation with this insertion of T, and, and, and this uh, choice is uh, made in order for the compatibility condition to be preserved. And that at the T is equal to zero, it's the equation that we know how to solve trivially. And at T is equal to one is the, uh, it's the original equation. So that's uh, easy to do. And now the, the main issue is to show that given this family, we want to show that the set of parameters for which this equation admits C2 alpha solutions is closed. That's the hardest part. Right? And, and, and super, so what does that mean? Well, essentially the key step is to show then that this set is, uh, right, if it's closed, right, and uh, openness is easy, so that it will contain then everything. Now to show that it's closed then, you see then that you have, a, uh, what you really need to, is that, if you have a sequence of uh, solutions, right, in, uh, in, in, uh, in some uh, C, to, C higher than two alpha, that it, that it has a conversion subsequence. So in practice, we, want, we just want to show that the solutions are uniformly bounded in the C3 norm as low for this parameter T. And this is essentially the outline of, of how that goes. Now, first, from general PDE theory, one can show that you have uniform C3 bounds if you have uniform uh, bounds for phi, for the Laplacian of phi, and for these particular combination of uh, uh, C3 derivatives. Namely, uh, they, they cannot be all bad and all unbad. They have to be mixed. 
So that's general uh, PD theory. And the classic calculation of Calabi as adapted the, to the uh, to complex setting by Nirenberg in the 50s shows that if you have uh, if you have uh, um, bars for, for this, uh, it, to get bounds for these mixed things, it suffices to have bounds for for phi and for the for the Laplacian of phi. And then the uh, another simplification due to Yao and Aubin was that you can get bounds for the second derivative, the Laplacian of phi, if you can get bounds for phi. So uh, putting everything together, you only need bounds for phi. So that was the key difficulty. And this was finally solved, overcome by Yao in 76 with precisely the C0 estimate. And, the, and I'll say more about this, but uh, uh, his method is the Moser iteration. And if you examine it very carefully, it shows that it will work as long as the right-hand side is in LQ for some Q bigger than N. And it's a complex dimension. So, uh, so let's uh, let us examine a little bit more right, this uh, uh, this uh, the the C three estimate, uh, C zero estimate. Oh, so, uh, what's happening here? Let me try another thing. Yeah, here it is. So, so so this is uh, this is uh, the uh, this was the situation. So as I mentioned, right, Yao's proof used Moser iteration, which, in, which is kind of unexpected actually, because that was a theory that was uh, introduced by Moser, right, for uh, bounds for linear equations in divergence form. So it's rather unexpected. It would work so well for the, for the complex motion pair, which is very different. But it turns out that the key thing is that from the complex motion pair equation, one can still get a bounce on the on gradients. So that means that here's our solution P, the solution of motion pair. One can prove that uh, that for any P, right, one has some bounds of this kind. So you see here a, a control of the gradient. And now you combine that with the Sobolev inequality. And the Sobolev inequality tells you that you have a function U and, and you can control the, the gradient of U as well as, uh, the L2 norm of U, as well as the gradient of U, then you can control a better norm, right? L2 beta, not L2, L2 beta, where beta is a number bigger than one. So that means that you can go from, uh, from U to U L2 beta. And if we take U to be phi to the P over two, uh, L2 of U is simply LP of P. And, and then from there, then you, you would go like this. You could improve from L, LP of phi to L, LP beta out of phi, uh, and then beta square and beta cube. And, you, and since beta is bigger than one in the limit, you would control L infinity. So that's, uh, that's, uh, that's how the, essentially the proof goes. And this, is, uh, this will work, as I mentioned before in the previous slide, if the, uh, if the right-hand side is in Q for Q bigger than N. And, and in fact, in his original paper, Yao yeah, also considered motion pair equations with right hand side and indeed uh, the, the full use is made of this flexibility. Now, uh, now the, the next uh, uh, development in the theory of uh, C0 estimate for motion pair uh, was by Cologier in, in 1998. And these are, he obtained in some sense a kind of definitive results because he obtained a, a C0 estimates as long as the right hand side is in LQ for some Q greater than one. Right. Now, so this, uh, the first thing one, uh, one should say is that this improvement, right, from Q bigger than N as in Yao's proof and from Q bigger than one here, right, is actually very important because they allow applications to singular varieties, for example, with Kawamata log terminal singularities. And there's another also thing you can wonder whether or not you can push it any farther. And there's actually a very nice counterexample to, uh, to a C0 estimate if the right hand side is only in L1. Right? One can see that if such a theorem is true, then the Keller Ricci flow and final manifolds will converge all the time and always give you a Keller Einstein metric. So that cannot be true. So, uh, so, so this was the situation. And one can, uh, of course, we, we want to know a little bit how Cologier obtained his theorem. 
So in some sense, uh, philosophically speaking, uh, it turns out that uh, his approach is based on the De Georgie's approach. So there's this uh, famous uh, theorem of De Georgie Nash Moser theory, obtaining uh, a C0 bounds and, uh, and, and Helder estimate. But the, the two methods are a bit different. And, Moser, and as you saw uh, earlier, Yao made use of Moser's approach, and, and now Kologie is going to make use of De Georgie's approach. So let me say the, some of the key features of De Georgie's approach. What happens in this approach, right, of which we shall say more later, is that we've tried to find a function of some parameter s so that the, the bound that we want, phi, let's say that we normalize our Mojampere equation to be to have a supremum zero because it's, it's a shift invariant, then uh, it suffices to, so what we want is actually a lower bound for phi and we want a function a, a small phi like this with the property that our unknown is bounded from below, right? If this function phi vanishes. Right? So for example, this is the choice of Kologie, right? So he, he considers this set where phi is less or equal to minus s and look at its capacity, right? So capacity in the sense of pluripotential theory is given by this, right? So it's uh, the, the Mont-Jampere volume and the supremum of uh, all such choices where u is between zero and one. So it's not difficult to see that if phi of s is zero, then this set has to be empty and that's the bound that you want. You want it. So that's, uh, that was uh, Kologie's approach based very much on this uh, pluripotential theory uh, and uh, which was introduced and developed by Bedford and Taylor. Right? Now that's a, that's a very powerful approach with which one can do a lot of things. But one of the difficulties about it is that it's very specific to Mojan Brea and uh, difficult to extend to, uh, to other equations. Now, so, so, so before I, I go into these other extensions, let me mention a few very important developments uh, all of which will play a role in, in our subsequent discussion. The first is that it turns out that in, in, for many geometric applications, it doesn't suffice to just have Kologie's estimates, but one needs some kind of an extension to cases where the background color form is not fixed, that it's allowed to degenerate to, uh, the, to, to just some, some closed and no negative form. So, uh, so on uh, ACDO Getch and ZIE on one hand, and the Mai and Pali uh, uh, proved such extension. In fact, it was very, very important indeed for applications. At the same time, uh, notice a little bit later, right, Blotsky in 2011 introduced yet another method for C0 estimate, this time using the uh, ABP Alexandro Bakelman Pucci maximum principle. Uh, this is, uh, it's kind of interesting because it works very well when the right-hand side is in LQ for Q bigger than two. So that's improvement over uh, Moser iteration that, gave, that required Q bigger than N, but still fell short of Kologie, because, which allowed Q bigger than one. Now this sounds rather uh, technical, but this method turns out to be very uh, powerful and applies in a lot of contexts. Uh, I, I, I will describe some of it later on, but for the moment, let me know that, for example, it was very effective in, uh, in, in getting estimates for equations that admit uh, subsolutions. Right? This was done by both Wang and Gabor Sekeridi. Now this, uh, so uh, with all of this, it was uh, uh, an, an open question whether not one can find a PD proof of these estimates. And uh, a, a, a big progress was due to Wang, Wang, and Zhou in 2019, right? And uh, 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 however, the approach is not ex extendable from to compact killer manifolds or to degenerating families. It had to be domains in CN. But they do, did call attention to an important feature, which is the Trudinger inequalities, and we'll discuss that a little bit later. And then in a different direction, this again, a work that dated only from last year, uh, the the theory of envelopes has been developed further by Getch and Lu, and that also provides uh, certain estimates for complex motion ampere, but this time on Hermitian manifolds. I will also say more about this later. Okay. So now, uh, let me uh, describe our, our, our main results. So, so this, this, I would like to, uh, this is some recent joint work from last year, 
with Bin Wu, who is an assistant professor at Rutgers, and Fred Tong, who is now here at Harvard, but was uh, uh, at Columbia at this time. And uh, uh, roughly speaking, what we are going to do is that we are, will obtain a new proof of Cologie's estimate, even with the, in the degenerating uh, 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 background uh, form uh, version, which is a PD proof and does not require pre potential theory. So due to this, it, it can give sharp estimates for new classes of fully nonlinear equations. And in fact, it's very flexible and applies to a variety of situations, some of which not even directly, directly related to C0 estimates, uh, to Dirichlet problems, to open the manifolds and so on. And I described this, uh, this uh, at the end of the talk. All right, so, so let, let me now describe the equations which we are going to consider. So, so we are going to fix a Keller form omega on a compact complex manifold. And then for any function phi, right, that satisfies the, this a pluri subharmonicity condition, right, we let H sub phi be the relative endomorphism between these uh, two forms, omega phi and omega. So uh, ex explicit in components, right, this is omega inverse times omega phi. The advantage of using this, of course, is that it is an endomorphism. So we talk, we can talk about its eigenvalues. So let the, let lambda of h be the set of eigenvalues of any matrix, Hermitian matrix h, and let let f right. This is ex, uh, expressed our equation. Any function of the eigenvalues of lambda, right, of, of this, uh, 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 which is defined on a cone invariant under the permutations of the eigenvalues, and these are equations that we are we are interested in. So the function of the eigenvalues of this relative endomorphism is equal to a given function. And because everything is in Ryan under a shift of phi by constant, unless otherwise uh, indicated, we just normalize uh, the sweep of phi to be zero. Now, th this is a, a, a somewhat awkward way of writing this because C can be absorbed into F if one wishes. Uh, uh, but however, because of the degeneration, which I will describe later, it's, it's uh, more convenient to write it. So F is normalized to be this, and, and C is a constant. So, uh, so we are going to require that the equation be elliptic. So that means that uh, the uh, DF, D lambda J is strictly positive. And now here's also a normalization which is that when you write something like this, then of course you can also consider the same equation with both sides raised to the power k, for example. Right? So for our purpose, because we want to define such notions as uh, energy and, uh, and entropy later on, right? So we, 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 we will normalize this to be homogeneous of degree one. So, <clears throat> so, uh, so now we, we make a key structural condition, right? which is that if we look at our equation and yeah, and think of it as a function of H, and if we differentiate uh, uh, it with respect to this uh, endomorphism H, we require that the determinant be bounded from below by constant gamma, which is uh, 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 strictly positive. And many equations satisfy this. So here are some very well-known ones. The Mojang pair, of course, when you take the, the product of the eigenvalues, and here take the one of n fruit to make it uh, uh, homogeneous degree one. But we also talk, uh, we'll discuss the many, the, uh, the Hessian equations, where instead of taking the product, you take the k the symmetric polynomial in the eigenvalues. And you can also combine, if you wish, uh, Hessian equations, quotients combining like this. And another very remarkable equation is this the p motion pair equation of Harvey and Lawson, which consists of uh, the product of all uh, sums of a p eigenvalues. And, and the cone is then required, is the one where this sum here is positive. In fact, uh, Blaine uh, Lawson in his talk uh, uh, two days ago uh, mentioned the, the very happy moments in, uh, in in math, when one uh, sees some unexpected connection. So in this uh, context, uh, uh, Blaine also told us that he and Harvey have come up with uh, different equations uh, uh, inspired from uh, symplectic geometry in Lagrangian. 
which uh, also satisfy this kind of uh, condition. Now, uh, uh, so as I had mentioned earlier, uh, for some important applications, it's important to consider the case where the background Hermitian form is allowed to degenerate. So, so, so this is the, the way we are, we're going to do this. So this is the setup. Let us look at chi, which is a closed, a no negative one, one form on this Keller manifold. And now we can have a family of Keller forms omega t defined by omega t is equal to chi plus t omega. So obviously, for t strictly positive, this is Keller. Right? That's what we are assuming. But of course, if we want, if we can have uniform bounds in t, in effect, we, we are actually dealing with chi. So, uh, so let's then uh, look at, at families of equations depending on this parameter t. So the solutions is then phi t, and the right hand side depends on t2 together with the normalization ct. And once again, as a misprint here, this should be phi sub t to zero. And, and, and this is again our normalization condition. So the, these are the equations that, that we want to consider. And now I can uh, state our main theorem. Right. So the main theorem is the following. We consider that family of equations and we assume that F satisfies that structural condition, which I, I mentioned in the, in the two slides ago. And now we require that for any P bigger than N, then we can bound the supremum of phi by a constant that depends only on omega, our reference uh, form, chi, this uh, degenerate form that we, uh, uh, we considered. P and N is the dimension, P is this, and gamma, which is the constant appearing in the structural condition. Uh, so this, of course, it depends on this, as well as an upper bounds for the following three quantities. So this one, as I mentioned to you, right, this is obviously the volume form of the degenerating matrix. And so what we need is that this, uh, that the, 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 that this, uh, the, the dependence is actually on the ratio of the, uh, of the, of the coefficient CTN divided by this volume. And then these two quantities, which, is, uh, uh, which can be interpreted as the energy of the, of the function phi t and the entropy. So the energy is defined by this, right? And in fact, uh, uh, you saw a version of that in the talk of Yao uh, earlier this morning, right? in the, for the case of, 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 uh, of their equ equation. So essentially it is, uh, it's the integral of minus phi against uh, essentially the unknown, uh, uh, essentially the equation. Right? So for example, uh, had it, uh, our equation being just the Laplacian, this would just be the Dirichlet integral. And more generally, this is the kind of uh, uh, functional one encounters in motion pair equations. Uh, notice that it does depend on phi. So, so we can bound only the swift, assuming that we know how to bound. And then there's another uh, uh, object, which is, uh, can be interpreted as entropy, because it is involved E to the NF, that's the right-hand side but then multiplied by F to some power P. So this of course can be viewed as a log of E to the N. So it's appropriately the, the entropy of E N. So this is the key theorem, right? One has completely uniform bound with constants depending on these three quantities. So let me, uh, this may look a little bit uh, 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 abstract at first. So let me illustrate it in the case of Mojang Pray to, to see what, uh, what this is all about. All right, so here's, here's the case of motion pair. So this is what I, 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 I'm, I'm going to claim, that if we look at the case of motion pair, the three quantities that we needed to, uh, to, to control, right, in order to have our C0 estimate, are on one hand fixed and independent of T. On the other hand, one can bound one of them, the energy, right? And, uh, and then, so, so everything will depend, our bound only depends on the entropy. And that's, that's exactly what we want, because the entropy, unlike the energy, depends only on the right-hand side. So, so let, uh, let's see why, right? So in fact, uh, let, let us look at, uh, at first at these quantities, right? So, so I, uh, let's rewrite our equation as a motion pair equation. So this is the left-hand side, which is the determinant, 
And this is the right hand side of Mojang pair with all these normalizations. And now it suffices to integrate both sides. So on, if you integrate the left hand side, that's simply the volume of, uh, of, uh, of omega t, right? right uh, and then on, on, on uh, right. so that's, uh, that's the volume of omega n t. On the right hand side, remember that this is normalized to be, uh, to be given by this. So on the right hand side is just ctn over omega n. So this, uh, this ratio here that we need is simply one over omega n, which is fixed as, uh, as, uh, uh, as, uh, as, uh, as mentioned there. So that took care of this annoying term. Now, the, the next thing is that uh, right, the claim is that the energy is going to be, we can bound the energy in the case of motion prayer simply by using the alpha invariant of Kenya. So, so let's, uh, let's see how, how this works. Well, let us look at this quantity. The alpha invariant tells you that if you, if you fix uh, um, a purely subharmonic function, right, uh, then the, the integral, I mean, you fix, fix, fix a reference form omega, then the exponential of, of uh, E minus alpha phi for some fixed alpha small enough is uniformly bounded, independent of phi. So this quantity here being uniformly bounded for all purely subharmonic functions with respect to a reference metric, right, is, uh, is the uh, alpha invariant of, of Kenya. So we, we have then this, uh, this inequality. And now it suffices that, remember that our, we want to apply this to phi t, which is only purely subharmonic with respect to omega t. But obviously omega t can be bounded by chi. So uh, I mean, uh, uh, omega t is uh, can, uh, by bounding chi by omega, we can bound omega t by a multiple pole of omega. So we can just view all of this as purely subharmonic uh, with respect to some multiple of omega. So applying this alpha invariant to this, uh, uh, to this uh, n times omega, you get this bound for all omega t. So that's why we have then this, uh, this, uh, this inequality on the right hand side. And now let's, uh, let's, uh, uh, let's apply Jensen's inequality. Uh, Jensen's equality will tell us that the integral of the log right, is less than the log of the integral. So, so the integral of the log of this, right? of course, you just get rid of this exponential. So you just get this term here, and then you get this term there. So, so this is the integral of the log, and it's less than the log of the integral. So that's log of C minus log of omega t. Now, from here, it's rather easy to see that we get what we want because of the following, right? If you look at the log of this ratio within the two volume forms, right? By the motion pair equation, this ratio is precisely ENFT by CTN. So the log of that is NFT and then plus log of CTN. So therefore the integral of this, which we saw up here in the previous formula, right? You split this like this. So then you have here NFT, right? That this is this term, right? And then omega phi n is given by this, by the equation, right? And then the other term is log of ctn. That just comes out as a constant and you integrate this with respect to this norm measure. So you just get log of ctn. So altogether, you obtain then that the, the integral of minus alpha phi is bounded by this expression, right? So you see then that our, our energy, right? Is bounded by even a, a very, L1 of uh, uh, L1 entropy and then times is other constant. So the theorem then gives you everything right? in, uh, as long as you can control the uh, uh, the the ecology. And this is uh, um, uh, this this is the the proof that we want. All right. Now, in fact, as expected, right, the moment you have a PD proof, it applies to a lot more cases. So, for example, a good case is Hessian equations. And you can essentially repeat this argument. And the only thing which is different is that if you deal with Hessian equation, the right analog of the cone is the so-called gamma K cone, if you're Hessian of order K. So, and luckily though, for purely subharmonic function, we use the Kian Yao invariant, right? But uh, for gamma K cone, there are weaker versions of that, which turn out to be good enough for, what, for our purpose. It's not a very, very refined estimate here. 
So, so, so we, this recovers again, all the results of DNF and Cologne for fixed background, but we also obtain an extension for, for to degenerating backgrounds and it works uh, with, uh, and gives uniform bound when the class chi is big in this sense. All right, so, uh, so, I, so I have uh, now explained this and let me just uh, uh, say a few more things. So, so what, what have we learned in the case of, in the case of uh, Mojampere and Hessian? It means that the three quantities that we needed to have our bound, right? The uh, volume ratio and energy and an entropy. And that for Mojampere and Hessian, uh, that in fact, the two of them disappear. And then we, we only need the entropy, which is great. It only depends on the right hand side. Now, however, for general equation, right? And I, I, I don't think you, one can do better than that, right? This uh, eliminating of these two of these uh, quantities in terms of the bound for only one does not seem possible if, if, if one allows a degenerating background. So, so we can only do it for the case of fixed background. Right? So in the case of fixed background, that means that you can get rid of uh, this uh, T here so this quantity is, is essentially one. So that, uh, and now, and now the, so the only problem then is for fixed background, can we control E of T, right? The energy by the entropy. Right? So this is, uh, and the answer turns out to be yes. I, I'll say a little bit more about how that's done. So here is a, here's a, the theorem, right? So let's now consider the case with a fixed given form, no degenerations, and this is the equation. And again, the entropy is defined by this formula. So the claim is that for any P greater than N, right? So to control the energy, you need P to be greater than N, then, then there's a constant in which you can control the energy and hence you obtain the entropy. So that's, uh, that's what happens. And let, uh, let me say a little bit about uh, this uh, theorem compared to the previous one. Well, this theorem actually, uh, right, is a, uh, is a bound for energy it uses a comp it also uses as you will see later a comparison with an auxiliary motion pair equation and in fact this one this one unlike the one that we are going to use for the for the proof the main theorem this one is actually the one used by Chen Chang in their 2017 breakthrough on matrix of constant scalar curvature and on top of it it also requires an adaptation of Blofsky's argument using the ABP inequality. And this is precisely why it's not, it, it doesn't deal as uh, powerfully with uh, degenerating metric. And, uh, and I, I would also like to mention that this theme of bounding energy from entropy has also been extensively studied by the Netza, Getsch, and Lu in the specific case of motion pair and the specific case of P is equal to one. And so in some sense, our PD method can be viewed also as an extension of their results to, uh, to more general equations, as well as a wider range of P, because we, we can deal with any P. All right, so this, uh, th this is essentially uh, an interpretation of these results. Right? And now perhaps more important than the theorems themselves, uh, maybe the method, right? And uh, as, you, as you will see, the methods are actually rather simple. Right? And uh, the simplicity perhaps ex uh, you know, makes them more easily applicable so, so, uh, uh, to other context. So let me try to give in some sense an almost uh, detailed proof of, of, of the main theorem. You will see that it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, can be easily adapted. So here's the, the key ingredient of the proof. So once again, right, again, we, we start from this, uh, uh, from this uh, De Georgie Nash Moser theory, but once again, we are going to uh, use the strategy of De Georgie. Right? So in the strategy of De Georgie, which is the one used by Kologie in, in, in his own approach, then as I mentioned before, what we want is to find a function P of S, right? So that it's vanishing, right? is equivalent to the lower bound for the uh, solution of the PD that we're looking for, right? So this is uh, what we want. And now, how do you obtain a function? How do you, how do you make sure that a function P of S is zero? Well, in fact, if you think about it, functions that are zero, usually uh, 
it's very hard to prove them. Actually, it's a, such a trivial statement because either they are manifestly zero, or otherwise, uh, you know, the fact that they are zero for for long range is that not that many tools. Right? So, so, so the the the, the key uh, uh, strategy of the Georgie is to show that the function satisfies a certain growth rate. Right? So, so. Uh, so the claim is that if you have a function P that satisfies its growth, where the right-hand side involves a positive constant delta, then if it converges to zero at infinity, it actually has to be zero already, starting from some finite, uh, finite value. And now in the Georgi's original approach to the Georgi nash moser theory, what is that function P? It's the most uh, simple one that you can think of if you introduce the set omega s here, to have uh, this bound here simply means that you want omega s to be empty. And, and so uh, our function phi of s, which is supposed to be, which is supposed to vanish, should simply take, be taken to be the volume of this omega s. So, so here, here's a choice, right, which is natural enough in achieving the, uh, the first criterion for, for, uh, for our choice. Right, and, and the name of the game is to establish this growth condition. So the Georgi did that for uh, equations divergence form, and Cologne did that for, uh, for his choice, which is the capacity of the set instead of its volume. Now, what, what is it? So the, uh, for us, what is it? The, uh, the key thing is then our choice. Right? So, so here, uh, uh, I'm going to, just for simply, uh, notational simplicity, uh, discuss the case of a single equation, because uh, if it's written in the right way, formulated in the right way, it will just uh, automatically extend to the case of a uh, degenerating background. So let me just take a single equation, and remember that in the proof of the main theorem, we allow constants that depend on this ratio of volume, which now I suppress because I'm dealing with a single equation, as well as the energy and entropy. So. So energies and entropies are viewed as uh, constants that we can control. So, so what, what's our choice? Well, in some sense, it's uh, very similar to the Georgi in the sense of taking the volume of this set omega s, but with respect to the, uh, to the measure defined by the unknown solution of the Mosin pair. So, so here's phi of s. And again, clearly, for it to be zero, uh, then you, you have, uh, you have uh, omega s must be empty, and you have your bound. And now the name of the game is to prove this uh, growth condition uh, uh, formulated by the Georgi. Right? Now, it's, uh, so here's the, another uh, key thing to prove the, the growth condition, which is written right here. The R phi is bounded by this. The key trick is to introduce an intermediate quantity. Right? A of S given by in the same thing, but with this insertion of the, of the kind of label set. And, and what we are going to prove is that we're going to prove that it's trivially that AS is bigger than this. On the other hand, this is the hard inequality, which, we are, uh, which we'll take some work. Okay. So, so that's our goal, right? And now, so, so in order to prove this hard inequality, so the, the key thing is to compare, right? The our function to the solution of an auxiliary motion pair equation, and the and and what's important is how to choose this equation, and how to uh, to show that the comparison holds. So in some sense, the very moment we have chosen a s, we have a good a good sense of what is the right motion pair equation. Right. So uh, so uh, what is it? Uh, well, here here is the the thing, right? The way we can think about it is that a s is simply what makes this quantity on the right hand side have volume one. So, so, so this is the naive thing. Uh, let's, uh, let's take AS and then put in this factor. Now, of course, this is very rough because uh, the, uh, the, uh, 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 this could be degenerate. We're taking the positive part only. Right? So typically, I don't want to go through the, uh, the, the details. Uh, let's just take a function tau k of x, right? Which is a positive function uh, depending on a, a parameter k that tends to this uh, to this function, which is uh, uh, x times the heavy side function, right? As k tends to infinity. Right? So the heavy side function is what account for the plus here, 
and then X is, is, uh, is what's left. So let, let's then take this regularization. So everything is now smooth. And let's now consider this auxiliary motion pair equation, right? And, uh, and then we have to uh, uh, normalize correspondingly. Right? So, so now by using this 1976 theorem of Yao, this motion pair equation admits a unique solution, which is normalized to have, uh, to be negative, let's say, and which is omega theory subharmonic. So, so, uh, so now we obtain this function psi of SK, and, and now the claim is the following, right? So we, our, the goal for introducing this is that our solution phi, right, can now be bounded by the solutions of auxiliary motion pair according to this formula. So uh, let, let's not go too carefully uh, into the details about what are these coefficients, but let me uh, point out the, the key thing. Of course, the fact that we have the structural condition with the bound, lower bound by gamma plays a role here. Right? Gamma has to be, uh, you have here a negative power and same there. Another thing that is very important here is in fact that you see here appear this ASK, right? Now ASK is the regularization of this uh, sublevel area AS, which I introduced earlier, right? And uh, in fact, uh, this is, uh, I want to point this out later, because uh, this AS here actually is going to give rise to the energy because you have a P against the, the unknown solution. And, and such terms, we can handle them sometimes, but not always. So, uh, so, so it, 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 it's good to keep that in mind. And so to prove this is not very difficult the moment you have uh, identified everything. So you, you just apply the maximum principle, right? So, and, and verify that this function here, the difference here is always negative. Okay, so, so that's the first level, right? Now, now what the, the moment you have obtained this comparison, perhaps the most important thing as you saw in the case of the uh, alpha invariant is that the, the function that you're comparing our phi to is now purely subharmonic. Right? In, in, before our, our function phi, belonged only to a certain cone, right? But the fact that this is purely subharmonic means that uh, the psi satisfies an exponential estimate. And, uh, and, and, and this is what I'm saying, right? That psi has a size of exponential estimate. And the, the comparison that I just obtained tells me rewritten that minus phi minus s divided by, actually it should be ASK here, ASK is, is bounded by this quantity. So now you see what happens. This is our comparison. And so uh, the, the exponential of this is going to be integrable. And so we'll get then a bound of involving the exponential of that, right? right? And you can see that I want to raise this to the power n plus one over n, right? To get rid of this power. And then the exponential will just split into a product, right? Which is what, what I'm going to do next, right? So, so, so this is exact, exactly, uh, what, what happened. And, and you see then that this quantity now is bounded by the alpha invariant. And now this ASK turns out that in the limit, they just tend to AS. So we can replace everything by AS. And you can also check that AS is always bounded by the energy. So, so that's, uh, that's what, let me flash you one back. That's why you obtain this bound, where this exponential bound, right, is bounded by a constant return. Now, this is what is, uh, you can think about this as a, a so-called uh, uh, Trudinger inequality, right? because Trudinger inequality is a kind of limiting uh, case for the, for the Sobolev inequality. And it does involve an exponential right? with underneath the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the norm of the gradient. So this is a, a Trudinger inequality. But what I want to do is that I want to convert it as in PDE theory to a so-called reverse holder inequality. So, so let, uh, uh, let me show you how, how to do this, right? So, so, so it's very simple. We just use uh, uh, Young's inequality, right? very generally written like this, where eta and eta inverse are two inverse functions of each other, right? And because here I have exponentials, so not surprisingly, I want to get rid of this exponential by choosing these eta as to be logs. So uh, uh, make, uh, making a, a, a long story short, right? I obtained this uh, formula, right? 
in right, bounding this exponential by a power of p by this. And now if I choose v, right, this one is for any v, if I choose v to be half of the uh, what appeared the exponential before, then this becomes uh, twice that. So that's exactly what happened to the exponential before. So that means that when I integrate, this term here is bounded, and what's left is just this, right? The integral of e and f, and then this uh, vz to a power p, vv is right. Uh, it's just uh, that you, you append it. So this is what one means by a reverse holder inequality, because remember that. A of S is defined to be this quantity, right? Now, if you apply Holder's inequality, you find that this can be controlled by some LP norm of it, right? or some higher than one. But rather, we obtain a reverse one here where, the, where something with a higher power is controlled by S. That's, uh, that's the manifestation of a PD. Okay. So, uh, so now that we have the reverse holder inequality, we can uh, finish things off reasonably fast, right? And obtain the inequality that we want, right? I claim that AS is less than PS raised to this power one plus delta zero. And as advertised, how to prove that? I, uh, right, I take AS and I apply holders inequality to AS, right? So you see here that AS involves the power one of this. So I raise it to this power and then have this other factor. But now this quantity here is precisely the one, right? If you uh, say is precisely the one that was estimated before, right? Here it is, right? So therefore, go, uh, going back, right? I can bound this then by, by AS to the power one of N plus one as it turns out, this factor here. So I put this to the side and then I obtain AS bounded to some power bounded only by this. So this is exactly our phi of S. So AS is like exactly bounded by phi of S to some power, which is what we want. And it reminds, reminds only to work out the exponent. So I, I spare you the details. If you work it out, you find the exponent is strictly bigger than one, which, which is what we want. Now, uh, and now we, uh, we can complete, right? So, uh, so I, as I mentioned to you, right, we already have, we just proved this. And this bound here is trivial. Because you look at omega s plus r, by definition, is the set where phi is less than minus s minus r. So this is less than omega s. And furthermore, if you look at as, integral of omega s, then minus phi minus s is bigger than r. Right? So I can replace this by r. And the rest, if I restrict myself to the uh, integral of this thing here, and that's exactly what I so, so we have obtained then this uh, the Georgi type of growth. And using the Georgi's classical lemma, we can conclude that the function has to be zero, starting from some finite number. And in fact, that finite number can be worked out explicitly in terms of the constants that enter the, the growth of, uh, of uh, the growth rate. Okay. All right. So, uh, so let me not, uh, not go, uh, say, say more about this. Let me uh, rather spend the next few minutes discussing the further development. And uh, as I mentioned to you, what I find uh, uh, you know, very uh, appealing about this is that it seems to be very flexible. And let, let, let me try to describe some of the things that one can obtain, uh, not as direct applications of the theorem, but simply by adapting the same idea. Right? So the first thing is the following. We are dealing in a nonlinear equations so for nonlinear equations, it's very important to have a so-called stability estimate because for linear equations, the invertibility of, uh, of, uh, or, of the equation is simply the, the existence of an inverse and, and, and stability is just the bounds of it for the inverse. In, for nonlinear equations, it's more tricky, it's, uh, more tricky than that. And uh, they have been obtained for motion pair and for the Hessian by Dinef and Collodier, right? And, uh, and so, uh, so using our methods, we can also obtain the estimates of DNF and Collodier, even allowing degenerations to big classes. Right? So for example, we obtain, here's a typical stability estimate. Here's the, you have uh, two equations, two solutions of equations with two right-hand sides. And, and you have here the, the, uh, how much they change. One has to be a little bit careful. This is only an L1 norm, but this constant here, 
depends on the LQ norm of phi and psi, but it shows that these two converge in phi. So, so and another uh, application is it can also extend to NEF classes. Right? So, so here, what, uh, what's the slight change that one should, uh, should uh, consider? In this case, before we compared our equation, uh, solution minus phi minus s to the solution of motion pair equation, here we have to insert the regularization of the envelope. Right? So, uh, uh, so, but after, uh, after we do this, the same argument as I see also. So it can also be adapted like this. Now, another approach is, uh, uh, this is actually a joint work with uh, uh, Chu Wen Wang, a student at Columbia. And, uh, uh, and here, this, uh, this uh, work is also similar in that respect. So the claim is that there is this very delicate situation uh, uh, where the right-hand side EF, right? If it is in LQ, uh, for Q strictly bigger than one, the function is held up. But if it is not in LQ, but only in something where the function is bounded, then we don't uh, know, nothing was known about the modulus of continuity. So, so this is what our method gives. This is a joint work. On one hand, Bin Guo and Jan Song use that method to obtain results. And we, Bin Guo, uh, I, uh, Fritz Song, and Chu Wen Wang uh, uh, developed it further. And we found that this, uh, this estimate, which I find rather striking, right? The modulus of continuity is the inverse of uh, uh, some power of the log. So this shows it's very delicate. And, and then there's another uh, application that was a little bit unexpected. Uh, and the, we, uh, all geometers, probably know this uh, classic result of Chang Li that gave a lower bounds on the Green's function on compact Riemannian manifold assuming a lower bound on the Ricci curvature. Now, it turns out that uh, in the Keller case, right, so this is, uh, we are more in a more restrictive uh, context, as long as EF is in LQ for Q greater than one. So this is some kind of indirect bound on the Ricci curvature. Because remember that uh, DD bar, the log of, of the uh, DD bar of F is the Ricci curvature. But this is a weaker, it requires EF to be in LQ. And if the scalar curvature is bounded from below, then we, uh, we also get lower bounds on the green function. As a PDE person, I find this uh, kind of attractive because uh, typically linear equations are used to study nonlinear ones. This seems to go the other way around at the end of the day. Right? We obtain some information, the green function, which is a solution of a linear equation, but using a more jumper. And, uh, and then uh, uh, the, the, this uh, same method of uh, auxiliary with uh, involving uh, Trudinger type inequalities has been adapted successfully by Chen and Chang to, uh, to the parabolic case. Right? This is a not, not a trivial adaptation uh, and it's, um, uh, and in fact, the class that they can handle is a rather interesting because it's the class introduced by earlier by Kao and Keller, uh, Collins, Hisamoto, and Takahashi. It's also a gauge equivalent, as you heard from uh, Tang Fei's talk, to the integrable case of the type 2A flow. So, so it seems uh, it's all right. So it, uh, it, uh, it does extend to the probability case, at least uh, to, the, to the right equation. Now, I, I just want to conclude with uh, a few more uh, uh, modifications. The first one, which is uh, uh, attracting a lot of attention nowadays, is the study of equations uh, on Hermitian manifolds instead of Keller. This has been motivated uh, to some extent by, uh, by, by physics. And, uh, and so now, if it is uh, Hermitian, the difficulty is that uh, the uh, the, the, uh, the associated motion pair equation may not have a solution. So what we have to do is rather is we, we use comparison to a local motion pair and we have to use the Dirichlet problem and the role of Yang's theorem is now played by Caffrey, Cornia, and Bergen's Sprague. And let me just conclude by saying that uh, it turns out that this uh, doing local things, you don't need a background uh, uh, 
uh, Keller form, and having no background Keller form, then no dependence on an energy is necessary. So this uh, ASK that we worked so hard uh, uh, earlier disappeared. So on the other hand, the, uh, the method does not deal so well with the case of degenerating metric. And finally, I would like to mention right, the, the so-called uh, form motion pair equation, of which here's one example. And uh, a very well-known uh, estimate of this is the C0 estimate of Tosati wine curve. And our method also gives us an advantage. Okay, so I, thank you. There, are there any questions? Uh, you have digital applause. Um, maybe uh -huh. I can ask a question. So can you use these estimates to prove uh, new things for these uh, PSH envelopes and like NEF and big classes or something like that? Or Well, there's uh, the work with, uh, uh, on, on NEF, as I mentioned, we can do it. Uh, we haven't looked at yet as a, a more general case, but I think it's the obvious way to do, uh, to go. And uh, I'm optimistic. <laughs> 